I should say something about Fukushima and also Chernobyl, but certainly now Fukushima and infertility. The, the, the truth is that infertility has been in, uh, increasing in the world for the last 30 or 40 years, probably because of all the radionuclides that, are, that people are exposed to originally from the weapons fallout, uh, the global atmospheric testing, and then from Chernobyl, and now from Fukushima. And there are things that people there can do to, to try and minimize, minimize this. Uh, but the main thing is to get away from the radiation but, and because they, what they have to realize is that this, this is an invisible, uh, it's an invisible attack on, on the human race. It's something that will, will appear over the next 20, 30, 40 years and, and its cause will not really be investigated. So we also predict, I also predict, on, uh, as a result of this ECRR model, that there will be significant increases in infertility in Japan as a result of this accident and this is quite terrible and in, any, in many ways it's more terrible than the cancer in adults because it's, it, it's destroying children who, who could have been born but now will not be born and some of those who are going to be born from our studies in the Middle East will have horrifying deformities and, and will obviously in an advanced uh, country like Japan will be aborted uh, 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 you know, um, uh, clinically, clinically aborted before they get born, so the, the birth rate will fall. Uh, what did the data show until now, before Fukushima? Oh yes, the the data has been showing that um, that the birth rate, uh, that the that the, the 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 sperm count in men has has been falling drastically. Uh, there was a very important study done in Jerusalem a few years ago, which showed that Israeli men had had very low sperm count, and that over the previous ten years it had fallen by a significant amount. And the, and the authors of that study said that if it continued to fall at the same rate. By the year 2020, that they would be totally infertile, and the Israelis would, would have no more children. It's as bad as that. It's as bad as that. And we are so we're, we're now, as a result of Fukushima, introducing a huge load more of this stuff into the atmosphere. But I have to say that it will mostly affect the Japanese, as far as I can tell. It will mostly be a Japanese affair, but that doesn't make it any better. And where does the radiation come in Israel? Come from in Israel? In Israel, it comes from the uh, use of, of uranium weapons. The massive, massive, massive use of uranium weapons by the uh, by the various military um, invaders, I suppose you would call them, the U.S., the, the, the Allies, they call them, uh, used hundreds and maybe thousands of tons of uranium weapons. Um, there's a new weapon now which uses uranium, and we've made measurements in the hair of the mothers in Fallujah uh, and uh, mothers of children with congenital anomalies. Uh, and this study hasn't been published yet, but what we have found is significant man-made uranium in the hair of these mothers, which is pro almost certainly the cause of the congenital anomalies. And where you have congenital anomalies, of course, you also have infertility. It's just that with, with in Fallujah, they, they don't have sufficient uh, medical methodology to, 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 to pick up these, these uh, deformities before they're born. They don't have all the ultrasound stuff and so on, but in the West they probably find these things and abort them early. So that's why we have these big increases. But the increases are associated with an environmental exposure to uranium. That's the point. And, and you have to remember that Fukushima contains probably 2,000 tons of uranium. 2,000 tons. Chernobyl had 200 tons, and 50 tons of it exploded. So, it, so all the things that Alexei Yablokov is talking about is a consequence of two, uh, 50 tons of uranium in Europe with a bit of with fission products, of course. But in Fukushima, there's more than that. There's, in principle, if the whole lot goes up, it's, it's a massive amount of uranium. And are there some uh, long-term consequences after 20, uh, 30 years, 40 years? Uh, it doesn't go away. What, 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 what Alexei says is true. It doesn't go away. Um, what Rosa Goncharova showed here in her talk, when she was studying the bank voles, the little animals that live in the Chernobyl zone, was that, that once you irradiate these, these, these creatures, and also human beings, Dubrova has shown this, you, you initiate a, pro a process called genomic instability. And then this is, this is like th throwing a switch. And what it does is it increases the genetic mutation rate, uh, quite apart from any mutation that the uranium causes or, or the radiation causes. That's a separate thing. This is like an automatic switch that is thrown at quite low doses. And then you pass this switch on to your children, and they pass it on to their children, and so on. And then with the bank rolls, uh, I know that they've studied the bank rolls and found that 22 generations have still got this switch. Now, I've studied the nuclear test veterans, 
these are these are the men who worked for the British Army uh, uh, at the nuclear tests in the Pacific in the in the 60s, and uh, I studied their children and their grandchildren. And what we found was that the children of these test veterans, this is the British, British Nuclear Test Veteran Association, have about a, a nine-fold excess of congenital malformations. But the extraordinary thing is that the grandchildren also have an eight-fold excess of congenital malformations. So the normal genetic idea that you, you pick off the weak and then it goes down and then you get the strong, and eventually, you know, this is the old nuclear idea of, of, the, of the nuclear war, all the, we, we just have radiation-resistant people who survive. It's just not true. What happens is that it throws a big switch and everybody is affected. And it's, you're affected for generations and generations. So it's, it doesn't even matter if the uranium goes away. It doesn't matter if these radionuclides all decay. Because you've imprinted something on the human genome, which is there forever. That's the danger. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Otto. Yeah. Japanese people like to boast about the taste and quality of their rice, but for many consumers around the world, it costs too much. So researchers are crossbreeding varieties to develop new types that are less expensive but still tasty. And now exporters are hoping they can capture a bigger share of the international market. The National Institute of Agrobiological Sciences, Japan's center of genetic research into rice. By March, scientists here had discovered more than 100 rice genes that could be useful in selective breeding. This is DNA taken from a grain of rice. It contains all of the rice's information. They researched chromosomes in the rice cells and analyzed the DNA. The scientists were able to learn the function of each gene. As a result, researchers were able to determine which genes resist disease, tolerate heat or cold, as well as which genes result in the growth of larger grains. They crossbreed delicious rice naturally with other varieties that carry the desired qualities. And by analyzing the genes, they select only those specimens that have the best characteristics. This method ensures quick and precise gene selection, and it also saves time. This technique is called genome breeding was that, that once you irradiate these, these, these creatures, and also human beings, Dubrova has shown this, you, you initiate a, pro, a process called genomic instability. And then this is, this is like sort of throwing a switch. And what it does is it increases the genetic mutation rate, uh, quite apart from any mutation that the uranium causes or, or the radiation causes. That's a separate thing. This is like an automatic switch that is thrown at quite low doses. And then you pass this switch on to your children, and they pass it on to their children, and so on. And the breeding used to take 10 years, but now it's possible to cut that time in half or even a third. Japan's agricultural industry will find this helpful. Japan has a big incentive to promote the genome breeding project. The amount of rice exports around the world has tripled since 1990. To compete in the global market, Japanese officials set a goal this year of lowering the cost of rice production by 40 percent, and it started developing new kinds in earnest. Our biggest goal right now is figuring out how to grow delicious rice more cheaply. We have to continue to develop new breeds. At the moment, they are trying to figure out how to lower the production cost of koshikari rice. Many Japanese consider it the best in the country. It's also popular outside Japan. If the researchers find a way to lower its cost, the rice could be sold at a competitive price. Koshihikari is one of the hardest types of rice to cultivate. It has many drawbacks. It can lack sturdiness. It's susceptible to blight and other diseases. And when exposed to high temperatures, its grains become white. In Toyama Prefecture, researchers have already developed a type of koshihikari that is immune to sickness and is sturdier than the conventional kind. Researchers are working on adding a gene to help protect the rice from problems caused by heat. Researchers have found that introducing a gene from a habataki variety would help reduce the problems caused by high temperatures. Now they are working on the selection process after the natural crossbreeding. 
I want to come up with a strain that is better than the current Koshi Hikari. We believe that we can make it easier to grow and more delicious. Is it possible to grow tasty rice that can be cheaply harvested? As Japan gets ready to compete more effectively on the world market, its researchers are making impressive advances. And, and you have to remember that Fukushima contains probably 2,000 tons of uranium. 2,000 tons. Chernobyl had 200 tons, and 50 tons of it exploded. So, it, so all the things that Alexei Yablokov is talking about is a consequence of two, uh, 50 tons of uranium in Europe with a bit of with fission products, of course. But in Fukushima, there's more than that. There's, in principle, if the whole lot goes up, it, it's, it's a massive amount of uranium. And are there some uh, long-term consequences after 20, of uh, 30 years, 40 years? Uh, it doesn't go away. What, 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 what Alexei says is true. It doesn't go away. Um, what Rosa Goncharova showed here in her talk, when she was studying the bank voles, the little animals that live in the Chernobyl zone, was that, that once you irradiate these, these, these creatures, and also human beings, Dubrova has shown this, you, you initiate a, pro a process called genomic instability, and then this is, this is like sort of throwing a switch. And what it does is it increases the genetic mutation rate, uh, quite apart from any mutation that the uranium causes or, or the radiation causes. That's a separate thing. This is like an automatic switch that is thrown at quite low doses. And then you pass this switch on to your children, and they pass it on to their children, and so on. And then with the bank rolls, uh, I know that they've studied the bank rolls and found that 22 generations have still got this switch. Now, I've studied the nuclear test veterans. Uh, these, are, these are the men who work for the British army uh, at the nuclear tests in the Pacific in the, in the 60s. And uh, I studied their children and their grandchildren. And what we found was that the children of these test veterans, this is the British, British Nuclear Test Veteran Association, have about a, a nine-fold excess of congenital malformations. But the extraordinary thing is that the grandchildren also have an eight-fold excess of congenital malformations. So the normal genetic idea that you, you pick off the weak and then it goes down and then you get the strong, and eventually, you know, this is the old nuclear idea of the, of the nuclear war, all the, we, we just have radiation-resistant people who survive. It's just not true. What happens is that it throws a big switch and everybody is affected, and it's, you're affected for generations and generations. So it doesn't even matter if the uranium goes away. It doesn't matter if these radionuclides all decay, because you've imprinted something on the human genome which is there forever. That's the danger. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>